Right. Hello, everybody. We're getting ready to start here on uh, uh, Takeo After Dark number seven. So we're just going to commit for a little bit. Got a couple minutes. A lot of people are coming on in. Uh, say hi, hello, how are you? And uh, type in your question. Just let us know that you're out there and you can hear us. Uh, looks like Dave, you got a message from Chris Coro. You, he, he's got your stickers. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> I still haven't got mine. So, so I got. I you got can get mine, I got mine. I got, I got mine, mine on my laptop. No, yeah, I got I got some on my laptop. I got some on my desk here. Everything's looking good. Yeah, I got a couple that came in the other day. Got one from uh, from Zella Plumbing over in Jersey, I believe. Uh, Raymond uh, Raymond James uh, Hoban, also from Jersey, and uh, and Flintstone. So I got a couple up on the wall behind me. I'll be bringing those over to the factory soon enough. Uh, as soon as I get back up there. Is Raymond James? Is that from uh, Tom Brady down in Tampa Bay? Don't start. <laughs> Don't start. <laughs> Don't start. The name of a, it's the name of a guy in a Bruce Hornsby song. So there you go. There you go. There you go. Raymond James. Raymond James. It is in that. Uh, wasn't that a Kenny Kenny Rogers song? No, it was Reuben James. Yeah. All righty. Well, excellent. Well, it looks like everybody can hear us. Yeah. So it's seven o'clock. Yeah. It's seven o'clock. John, you want to do the the official welcome and kick this kick this uh, whatever the heck it is off? <laughs> Thank, thanks everyone for uh, jumping on board. Uh, part seven. I can't believe it. We've done seven weeks of these. Uh, thank you again for jumping on. Part seven: the real value of variable speed circulators. So thanks again to Rick Mayo, David Holdorf, and uh, John Barber for putting these together. Mechanical Hub is very, very proud to work with you guys on this. So thanks again and enjoy uh, part seven. John, take it away, buddy. All righty. Thank you, John. Appreciate thank it. You, John. Thank you. Thank you, Mechanical Hub. I mean, guys out there in, in webinar land, a big round of applause for Mechanical Hub for putting this together. and. Uh, and promoting this, this has been really awesome. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to to, to share this information and, and to spend a little time together on Wednesday night. So this is kind of, I don't know about, about Rick or Dave, but this is kind of the high point of my week. <laughs> like maybe that tells you, maybe that tells you the relative you know value of my life, but I, I mean, this is this is really the high point. This is, a, this is a heck of a lot of fun and I really look forward to it. Uh, um, let's do a quick, uh, just quick around the horn. Uh, again, John Barba from Takeo, uh, sitting here in, uh, in my second floor apartment in Exeter, New Hampshire, looking out the window. And beautiful day today, although a little blustery in New Hampshire. And uh, let's let's go around the horn and uh, have the other guys introduce themselves and uh, take it away, Rick and Dave. Hey, everyone uh, from Sandy, Utah here, and it's kind of cleared up outside, uh, cooled off, probably about 60 degrees and uh, enjoying my Wednesday evening with everyone. Dave Holdorf, go ahead. All righty. Dave Holdorf here, a.k.a. Dr. Evil, <laughs> as you guys gave me the name last week. <laughs> I'm in my lair. You'll never find me, have no idea where I am. So I am uh, <laughs> I am enjoying my evening as well with all you guys uh, logging in right now. So what do we got? Uh, we got 150 people here so far, so looking good. All right. Looking good. Looking like good. It. Yeah, we got like Dr. It. Evil. We got the Lorax. And then there's just me who, you know, blue eyed, good looking guy, I think is really all we need to say. So anyway, uh, all right, let's go. Let's go. Uh, hey, um, just a couple quick, uh, just quick housekeeping, just so you guys remember, uh, you want to you want to ask a question, that little cartoon balloon on your on your uh, control panel. Just click on that and type in your question just to make sure everybody's got that down. Just do a little quick. Hi. Hello. How are you? Uh, you know, type that in for me. That way I know everything's working for you guys. I know Art Williams, Mike Flynn, Jeff House, Steve Lipsy. Very good. Dan Cook. Glad to have you with us. Daniel Leary. Very good. Very good. We even got a question from Daniel already already. So we'll get we'll get to that one. We'll get to that one. Love the T-shirt. That's right. You like the T-shirt? I'm your Huckleberry. That should give you a little bit of an idea of the theme of tonight's performance. <laughs> uh, for Taco After Dark. So let's get the show started. Um, again, again, one last reminder, guys. Treat this like you would like if we were in a classroom together. Okay. This is pretend we're in a classroom. 
and we're in front of the class teaching and you're at a table, you should have a pen and a pad of paper with you right now. And I want you to take notes. Just write stuff down as it comes up, as things occur to you. And please, please, please ask whatever questions that come to mind. There's no such thing as a dumb question. There are dumb answers, I think, as the three of us have proven over the past <laughs> six weeks, uh, seven weeks. But there's no such thing as a dumb question. So please make sure to ask it. And, and as always, we'll stay on as long as you guys have questions. We got no place else to go. It's getting dark outside and it's it's take go after dark. So we're here. We're here till the last teardrop falls, boys and girls. <laughs> so tonight's uh, tonight's episode, episode seven, the real value of variable speed circulators. If you remember last week, we went over variable speed circulators in kind of a cursory way. We talked about what they were, but most importantly about what they weren't. And we referenced the, the great John Ford movie, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Remember that last scene? When legend becomes fact, print the legend. So much misinformation and non-information that's out there about what these things do and what these things don't do. And we've heard them all from, hey, I put these in and they always give me the right flow to the, you know, to, hey, you put this in, it does the thinking for you. It takes the thinking out of it. Another some such nonsense. They're not that smart, man. They do what they do, and you've got to understand what they do so you can make the most of, of the application. And they can do some pretty incredible things that do some really great stuff for our systems, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. But last week, we talked about, you know, the, the, the trying to separate the myth from the legend, the fact from the fiction, so to speak. All right, we talked about the truths and the myths of, of ECM circulators, and we got into a discussion. We started talking about delta T circulators and delta P circulators, both very, very good pieces of equipment. We sell both. We, we, we're happy to sell you both. They're, they're similar, but there are some differences, and we'll discuss those in a little bit more detail tonight as well. And again, answer, and answer whatever questions you guys might have. And here's the thing, maybe the big takeaway from last week, and it's to me, it cuts to the very essence of how hydronics works. The circulator may very well be the most important component in that system in determining how effectively, how efficiently, how economically, and for how long that system's going to operate with, with in a relatively trouble-free manner. The circulator's the thing that makes the water go round and round. The boiler makes the heat, and that's important, you know, but the heat's just sitting in the boiler unless something happens. The heat emitters deliver the heat, but they're just sitting there in the room waiting for the heat to get from the boiler to it. The circulator facilitates that journey, all right? The, the circulator facilitates the journey, and how it does it and in what manner it does it is going to make a huge difference in how your system operates. And this is the thing, I guess, the biggest takeaway I want you guys to remember is whether we're talking delta T, whether we're talking delta P, or whether we're talking fixed speed circulator, no matter what, it all comes down to the interaction between system curves and pump curves. You can't escape that interaction. Systems work where system curves say they're going to work or where pre-programmed algorithmic performance curves say that system's going to work. The circulator makes that decision. The circulator enforces that reality. So no matter what, it's not the system's going to do what the system's going to do. That's a lot of nonsense. It's the system's going to do what the circulator says it's going to do. Now, now, we have ways to manipulate that and make that work in our favor, but don't ever forget that. That's maybe the most important part. All righty. So this week, we are going get to get into talking about how these things affect systems. And one of my favorite topics, the incredible shrinking delta T. Delta T, if flow stays the same and load changes, delta T gets smaller. That's just math. And we'll explain that math a little bit just so you understand it. You're never going to do the math, but just so you understand where it comes from. And what's the importance of that incredible shrinking delta T? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Why does it happen? And does it have to happen? We can talk about all of those things. All right. And how to pick the right variable speed circulator for your application. So all that stuff's going to get talked about tonight. So let's get to work. And let's talk about why does the delta T shrink so ever so incredibly? Or how does why does the delta T shrink incredibly so? Or why does the delta T shrink so incredibly? Take your pick, all three apply. Um, and I gotta say, Tombstone, second greatest Western ever filmed, in my opinion, and it's in the top six for all time movies, in my opinion. Since I'm running the show, my opinion's the only one that matters. <laughs> um, but just so it's out there, and if we and if you guys want to take a couple of stabs over the next uh, the next uh, next hour about what the best Western ever made is, then we can we can talk. We'll talk as we go along. 
But Tombstone, number two, all-time greatest Western. Because because of this man over here, Val Kilmer. All righty. So why does the Delta T shrink incredibly so? It's the math. The math kind of says it has to. All right. You don't get around that. It's math. And again, you don't have to under, do this math. Just understand what it exists. What I'm showing here is, a, you know, a, a, a typical three-speed circulator set to contractor, no callback motor, the Taco 008 single speed, whatever, whichever one it is. We're, we're, we're in high speed. And those system curves, those five black lines, those are system curves. And what you're going to see, and they represent different combinations of zones that are calling at a given point in time. And as you see, different li the lines will intersect the pump curve at different points, which is where it will perform, where the system will actually operate in terms of flow and in terms of head differential. So let's say I've got a 70,000 BTU zone valve job, 70,000 BTU house, all right? 70,000 BTU house. Uh, if we apply the universal hydronics formula, which states that GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500, and we're designing typical North American system to a 20 degree delta T, 70,000 divided by 20 times 500, if we presume 100% water, 20 times 500 is 10,000, 70,000 divided by 10,000, there's a required flow rate under design conditions, coldest day of the year for this job of 70,000 or of seven gallons per minute. All right, seven gallons per minute, 70,000 divided by 10,000, that gives us seven gallons per minute. In addition, we'll also calculate the head loss, which we've shown you already in previous, in previous segments. And we find the worst case head loss zone in our zone valve system is five feet ahead. So when I size my circulator, my circulator is going to have to deliver seven gallons a minute at five feet ahead. Now, where does the system, and that's right here, okay, that's right there. Now, where does the system really work? Well, the system's really going to work where the system curve and the pump curve intersect, and that's way the heck out here. And that looks to be at about 9.5 GPM at let's say eight feet ahead. Now, are we gonna have any problems with the system working out there? Absolutely not. Can we deliver 70,000 BTUs with nine and a half gallons a minute instead of seven all day long and twice on Sunday and we're not even gonna break a sweat? Does eight feet ahead cause any issues when I only need five? None whatsoever. So from a standpoint of, is this system gonna work? Yeah, I got no problems. Nobody's freezing to death and blaming me. I've done my job, life is good. All right, that's the reality of the situation. However, however, numbers don't lie, okay? Numbers don't lie. Now remember, GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500. That's the universal hydronics formula. It's also algebra. Remember that algebra you took back in sixth, seventh grade and you're thinking, Man, this is garbage. I'm never gonna use this crap in the real world. Ha 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 ha, today's the day, all right? We can isolate for delta T. We simply do a little algebraic manipulation and we find that delta T equals BTUH divided by the GPM you we're using to deliver the BTUH divided by 500, all right? We do that math and we can find out what the delta T would be under this situation. So in this case, 70,000 BTUs under design condition divided by the nine and a half gallons per minute I'm using to deliver those BTUs divided by 500 gives me a delta T in this case of 14 degrees. That's the best delta T we're ever going to see in this system, boys and girls, on the quote unquote coldest day of the year, as provided there's no fudge factor built into any of this stuff. We haven't done a little fudge factor with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, with, with the heat loss, you know, like that never happens. We haven't had any fudge factor with the actual installation of the heating elements, oh, like that never happens. Or maybe the heating elements have been perfectly designed and installed according to the heat loss, which has 15% of fudge factor built in it already, all right? So this is optimistic at best anyway, people, and it's only gonna happen under design conditions the day, the, 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 the outdoor design temperature we use to calculate that heat loss. That's the best, the theoretical best it could ever be. So instead of the water going out at 180 and coming back at 160, it's going to go out at 180 and come back at 164 or 166 rather instead of 160. So there's a difference there. All right. Think about that. Just keep that one in mind. Let's also take a look at the smallest zone. Our smallest zone, let's say it's 10,000 BTUs. Well, that using the formula tells us it's going to be one gallon a minute. And let's say that one gallon a minute zone happens to be four feet ahead. So it needs to be right here. 
Now, where is it going to really work? Well, it's going to really work where the system curve intersects the pump curve. So it's going to be working way up there at about 17 feet ahead and at about two gallons a minute instead of the one that's required. So I'm doubling up on my on my on my flow rate to deliver that ten, those 10,000 BTUs. So again, numbers still don't lie. We fill in the blanks: 10,000 divided by two divided by 500. Then we're talking about a 10 degree delta T. So again, the, the theoretical best delta T we will ever see in this system, the theoretical best delta T we're ever going to see in this system is going to be bopping back and forth between 10 and 14 degrees. So maybe the water's going out at 180, coming back at 170, or low temperature boiler going out at 140, coming back at 130, going out at 140, coming back at 126. Is this what we want? Is this what's best for the system? Is this just something that happens and we can't do anything about it? No, this is just a fact of life by you, we over pumping the zones. We have a chronic over pumping problem in our industry because we this because of a, a basic, I, again, it's, I'm not gonna say misunderstanding, but it's a, hey, I, a three speed pump's the only pump I'll ever need. I put it on high because I ain't never had no problems. So we'll be fine, all right? And you're not gonna have any problems if you define problems as people freezing to death and blaming you. In, in that case, you can say, I put it on three speed, it works, my job here is done. However, however, we cannot, we cannot ignore that because what does that lead to, all right? What does that lead to? It looks like somebody just walked over your grave. Why does the delta T shrink? The delta T shrink because it has to. The load goes down, the flow stays the same. GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500. GPM stays the same. The load fluctuates. The delta T's got to fluctuate along with it. That's only natural. It's the only thing it can do. Why do we? Why does it shrink? System curves and pump curves. We work where they intersect, and there's no getting around that. All right. And it's math, man. GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500. That kind of rules the game. Okay. So it's just the way it is. Now, the end result of this incredible shrinking delta T, and again, it's not that it's shrinking just as it's getting warmer. The coldest day of the year out, we don't, we've got a delta T of 10 to 14, all right? What's going to happen? What's, uh, let me ask you guys, what, you write it in in the question section, what, pray tell, is going to happen to the boiler? What's going to happen to the boiler? at what's going to happen at the boiler you guys type it in i want to see what you what you guys have to say we got we got a tim dice we got a mike lampkin we got a bob back act we got jerry mcpeak ya -binga -ba -binga -binga. everybody's got it yep short cycling short cycling see what that uh, that clown on the left what kind of a, what kind of a cycle is he on he's on a short cycle, short cycle. That, that the man bun dude on the right what kind of cycle is he on he's on a short cycle and this is the best it gets. What happens when it's 50% loadout, all right? What happens when it's 50% loadout? And it's it's 35,000 BTUs instead of 70,000 BTUs. I'm still pumping nine and a half GPM, man. So now my delta, the best delta T I'm gonna see is between five and seven degrees. And that's it's a 50% load, right? Yeah. It's 50% it's load. And, and we spend 50% of the heating season at one third load or less. So at least half of the heating season, we're going to have delta T's less than five. All right. Oh, well, it has to be that way. <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be that way. Is there any benefit to having it that way? No, not really. It doesn't need to be that way. We can certainly stretch it out. And there's advantages to stretching it out and basically short cycling. Anything else? Well, when we short cycle, what do we do to all the moving parts in the system, right? What do we do to moving all the moving parts in the system? We're going to be on off, on off, on off, on off, on off, on off. Have any of you had to replace an igniter, an ignition module, uh, some sort of control within the system, a blower motor, okay? A heat exchanger prematurely. What, what, uh, what, where do you think that happens? Why do you think that happens? Where do you think that comes from? It comes from short cycling, all right? It comes from short cycling. So, excellent. How are we doing out there for questions there, Dave and Rick? What do you got anything good? Anything Mostly good just comments. Mostly yeah, just, just comments. Yeah, comments answering yeah. your short cycle question. Very yep. good. Very good. Well, there All was right. there was a good question that came in a little while ago. 
All right. And John Allen, he was saying, you know, is there any savings running a 30 to 35 degree delta through a baseboard application where we're typically designed for a 20 degree delta, especially with a ModCon boiler? And, and Rick had answered saying, yes, the average temperature rules. It does work and it does work well. The only thing you need to watch out for if you would have designed, if you would have set it up for a, say, 35 degree delta is the last piece of baseboards on that loop if you had. And right. it would see a cooler temperature. So just make sure you have enough length of baseboard in there to handle that lower temperature that those end loops are going to, those end radiators are going to see. So, but otherwise, right. oh yeah, definitely on a ModCon boiler. The colder the water, you know, I want to send ice cubes back to that boiler. So mm -hmm. yes, definitely. And, and and also if you're dealing with a two pipe system or like a direct return, like a, like a, like a typical European system, again, we don't install many of them here, but where you've got a supply and a return back to a main manifold. So we've got each radiator has its own supply and own return. Well, now in that case, it's just one panel, right? You could do a 40 degree delta T there if you wanted to. You know, that means the you know the, you've got a you've got a big piece of you know of, of of aluminum that's filled with water to kind of absorb that. So yeah, you 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 could do it there as well. It's a little trickier with baseboard, quite frankly, because yeah, you've got a you've got you know you'll have a lower average water temperature and you're going to be concerned about the water temperatures in the in the subsequent pieces of baseboard and would would you need more under design conditions yeah i think so i think so all right very good here's one you assume these initial flows and heads don't understand that your calcs would be that far off uh well jim I, that's a very good point however you know we, we we're presuming the math has been done here uh here's the thing about about um heat loss calculations, whether it's, you know, the, 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 the holy and sacred manual J or IBR or anything else, they're all based on certain assumptions. All right. They're based on certain assumptions and there's, there's really, I, it, there are different percentages of fudge built in, you know, none of them's dead bleepity bleep on accurate, you know, they're all going to be very, very conservative, some more conservative than others. But to say I did a manual J heat loss and that's the heat load, it, to me, is a little optimistic. That's you make you could be anywhere from 10 to 15 percent off, maybe 20 percent off. And often, what a lot of people will do when they do a heat loss calc is, you know, the ASHRAE outdoor design temperature says it's it's you know 10 degrees here in this area, and guys will say it gets colder than that here. It gets colder than 10 degrees. We got to go to zero, or we got to go to minus 10. Well, then you then you're just exaggerating your heat loss. I mean, that's just the way it is. So, yeah, they can't. I mean, I understand you want to do the math and get as close as you can, but there's fudge built in there. Absolutely. In fact, when we had our um, our Flow Pro Designer heat loss software, we had engineers tell us that they would not use it for for heat loss unless there was a user adjustable safety factor. What what what's another word for user adjustable safety factor? Dave and Rick. Fudge, baby, fudge. Fudge, baby. Yeah. Yeah, CYA. Say, well, yeah. If if I I'm gonna do whatever this thing come up with, I'm adding 20%, baby, because I don't want the phone call neither. And it's just the way it goes, man. It's just the way it goes. So so good good question. And yeah, I mean it's not that they're far off, it's just that that's kind of that's kind of what that's kind of where it is, man. Yeah. I'm the king of load fudge, right? There you go, Jim. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. All righty. Hey, trivia time, trivia time. Got a good one wow. for you. Got a good one for you. Here we go. Oh, boy. The Taiko trivia question of the night. During World War II, Taiko joined other U.S. manufacturers produced to produce critical components for the military. What two products? What two products did Taiko manufacture for the U.S. war effort? Was it was effort? That should be war war effort. <laughs> there you go. The war effort. And uh, in fact, one of them, we received an award from the government for from the military for for for, for cost control. So um, what two products did Taiko manufacture uh, of note for the U.S. war effort? All righty. And then just type your answers in and we will uh, pick the we will pick the uh, correct ones. And then we'll we'll do a we'll do a random selection, which I think we have to randomly select last week's winner. Do we not, Dave? Oh yeah, you're gonna have to give me some time to set that up. I totally forgot. Okay, well, I'm glad you were paying attention. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna have to give me some time to set that up. We'll 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 raffle that towards the end of the night because now I got to write down all the names that. that oh, uh, okay. There so, we go. There we yeah. go. Um, I will get to that winner tonight. Yes. 
Very good. What is the formula for calculating delta T across an inflow radiant circuit? Uh, that's generally specified. It's a good question, Philip. Generally specified by the manufacturers. Most, for the most part, uh, most radiant systems, you're going to see a, a residential radiant. You'll see about a 10 degree delta T. Uh, and that's to keep the, um, that's to keep consistent floor surface temperatures. All right. Uh, keep those, you know, from, so you're not walking, like, here's a warm spot, not quite as warm. This act, spot's actually kind of cool. So that's, that's generally done. Now, there are going to be instances where that gets stretched out to 15. Some using smaller tubing might be actually designed to a 20 degree delta T. And that's, that's just a, that's a function of the size of the pipe. Snow melting is generally, generally a 30 degree delta T. And those are just, again, industry standards. It's not a calculation to figure that out. It's just things that, things that you know. All righty then. Let's get back to work. Say when. I love this movie. <laughs> so back to work. Remember, the circulator is in charge. And the bigger the pump, the bigger the problem. And the question we want to address now is how do variable speed pumps, whether they're delta T variable speed pumps or delta P variable speed pumps, how do they help this problem? Neither are going to solve it or make it go away entirely, but both have the ability to, 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 to mitigate some of that short cycling when they're applied properly, when they're applied properly. So let's take a look. Now, what you're looking at here, this is the pump performance curve of our delta T circulator, the VT2218. The VT2218 gets its name from 22 feet ahead all the way down to 18 gallons a minute, all right? This green wedge is very important because that's the operating parameters of the VT2218. It can't go any faster than that line at B, and this is important. It can't go any slower than line A. It has a minimum speed. It has a minimum speed. It just doesn't go down to nothing because the math says it can. I mean, that would be silly. So let's let's take a look at how this will operate. Now, again, let us presume we're going to go back back again and, and presume that that seven gallons per minute and five foot ahead is dead on accurate. OK, it's dead on accurate. It is it. OK, uh, just to illustrate how the 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 the. Um, VT2218 works. Now, under design condition on that coldest day of the year, you're going to have uh, you're going to have this thing set up and there's a sensor, a strap-on sensor on the supply pipe going out to the system and then on the common return coming back from the system. And the circulator will vary its speed to maintain the desired delta T within the system. In this case, we designed it to a 20. Let's try to maintain 20 for as much of the heating season as we can to kind of mitigate that short cycling. So let's say everything started up, all right, on the design day, coldest day of the year, and here we are, seven gallons a minute at five foot ahead right there. There's the circulator. It's gonna operate right there. Your system curve is kind of gonna go up like that. And bazinga, it's right there operating at seven at five. And this is the maximum speed. And that maximum speed look, it looks like it's about 50% of the total. And this thing goes from nine watts up to 59 watts. So that might be, I don't know, about 30 watts maybe right there. And that's the fastest it's going to go. Now, this line represents the single smallest zone, one gallon a minute at four feet ahead one gallon a minute at four feet ahead. So it's going to operate on that line with that one zone calling. As zones open, all right, as zones open, the delta T on that system is going to naturally want to get a little wider, all right, because we're taking more energy out of the fluid. The sensors pick that up, the pump speeds up, and we go faster and faster until we hit our max. So as the sensors pick up a widening delta T, which is what would happen as zones open, all right? And it's gonna say, oh, the zones are open, the delta T is getting a little wider, I better giddy up some, and it's gonna go a little bit faster. And then when it reaches all zones open, it should be operating right on this line under design conditions, all right? As zones close, it does exactly the opposite. It goes back down the other direction. All righty, now, Here's where that minimum speed just comes into play, all right? The minimum speed comes into play when, let's say, we're at 50% load, all right? Let's say we are at 50% load, okay? 50% load, that's three and a half gallons a minute, 35,000 BTUs. 
as we follow out our system curve, all right, three and a half gallons a minute is a little over a foot ahead. Well, because we have minimum speed, we can't work there. So where does it work? It works where the system curve intersects the pump curve, which in this case is right here, all right? It's gonna work at about four gallons a minute. Guys, we're not gonna have a 20 degree delta T then. It's just not gonna happen. And as it gets warmer and warmer out, that delta T will start to shrink some. But the point here is it's not gonna have a five degree delta T, okay? That's the point. I don't know why people find that so hard to understand. And there's some folks out there that just don't get this, but that's all we're trying to do. Keep the delta T as wide as we can for as long as we can so the boiler short cycles as little as possible. Is it gonna short cycle some as we get into the warmer months? Yep, there are no two ways around that. Just not gonna be as bad as it was. Now, does this work with, with outdoor reset and ModCon boilers? Does it fight with outdoor reset? No, it doesn't care what the water temperature is. It's not trying to set the water temperature. It's just watching the difference between the two. It's the difference between what's going out and what's coming back. It doesn't care what that temperature is. It's just watching the difference between the Gazauta and the comes back to, all right? Any questions out there, guys? How are we doing? How's everything looking out there, Dave and Rick? Any questions popped up that we need to deal with? Just try to answer the call uh, uh, for the trivia question. And uh, one one uh, fellow, Douglas, looks like he's left, but he had a question about he's running 2218s on uh, cast iron baseboard application. Mm -hmm. I think he's just kind of making a statement. They ramp up to high, which is our start cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, baseboard heats up, the pumps modulate down and lengthens the run cycles of the system. Uh, absolutely. That, kind of that's like it's it supposed does. to. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty much what it does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you, Douglas. All righty. Now, the tail of the tape on the VT2218, again, maintains fixed delta T, improves boiler performance. It has an LCD screen for easy programming. It, because you have sensors on the supply and return, that screen will also display the supply and return temp. So there's no need for any gauges or anything. And you have some optional operating modes. It could be a four speed, fixed speed pump if you wanted it to be. Uh, chilled water mode, you got to reverse things, but it could be set up in a chilled water mode or a set point temperature mode, and it'll maintain a fixed temperature in something if you wanted it to. So that's kind of the tail of the tape of the 2218, but delta T is kind of the, 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 the main focus point of this, the, of how this circulator works. Uh, it comes out of the box programmed for 20, but it can be, you, you, can, you can adjust it as per the needs of the job, anywhere from five up to, to was it 55, five to 55 or five to five 50? to 50 in, in uh, one degree increments, five to 50 in one degree increments. Thank you, Rick. That's why I bring Rick with me everywhere I go. He knows the answers to the hard questions. <laughs> All righty. Now let's take a look at Delta P and how Delta P can help things work. Delta P, uh, a lot of people look at Delta P as a constant pressure or this thing tries to adjust the pressure to different loop lengths. It's a pressure regulated circulator. Nah, it's really it's really kind of an incorrect statement. It's resistance regulated. What it regulates, it, it changes its speed and functioning based on what kind of resistance the impeller is encountering. All right. In a constant pressure mode, which is the, the mode you want for, for zone valve applications, it's trying to maintain a fixed pressure differential, a fixed head pressure differential within the system. Um, so say you have it set up for 10 foot ahead, zones open, all right, pump's gonna go faster, zones close, pump's gonna go slower, but always along that 10 foot of head constant pressure performance line. System curves and pump curves, people, it has to do that, it has to work up there. So it's gonna work on that prescribed line, okay? Now the, the, the trigger that tells this thing to speed up or slow down is resistance against the impeller, as we said. That impeller's spinnerating, okay? And let's say I've got five zones open and it's spinnerating and having itself a grand old time. A zone closes. When a zone closes, all of a sudden, that impeller is spinnerating against a little bit more resistance, a little bit more resistance. Now, what's that a signal for the circulator to do? Circulator's gonna think about it and says, hey, something must have closed. I don't gotta run so fast, it slows down. Okay, that's all it does along that prescribed uh, performance uh, curve. All right, another zone closes, more resistance, we slow down again. Zone opens, less resistance. Hmm, 
something's changed, I must go faster to maintain my 10 foot of head constant pressure differential. That's how it works under constant pressure, which is the most common mode that you'll use it in. A lot of people like delta P because it's less expensive than delta T and there are no sensors involved internally or externally. In a little delta P pump like that, there's no sensors internally, obviously, and there's nothing external that you have to set up. So it's kind of simple and easy and less expensive, but the performance curve is fixed. And here's an example of that. All right, this is the 0015 E3. Take those 0015 E3. It's a three setting circulator. The low setting is five foot ahead. The medium setting is 10 foot ahead. And the high setting is full speed fixed speed. So in the low and the medium, both what you have here are both what both are ultimate flat curve pumps. They're going to dis, they're in, in from here to here or from here to here, the pump will vary its speed in order to maintain that fixed pressure differential. We kind of showed you an illustration of how that works last week. Um, <clears throat> but let's take a look at our seven gallons a minute, five foot ahead system. It's going to be right there. All right, seven gallons a minute. Five foot ahead, I'm working right here because here is the system curve. All right. Seven gallons a minute, five foot ahead. She's going to be working right there. Okay. And bingo. One gallon a minute at five, four foot ahead. That's my smallest zone. Well, it can't work there. It has to work up here at maybe one and a quarter gallons per minute. Now, as these zones open, we're going to go that way. As the zones close, we're going to go that way as the system curves intersect the performance curve, all right? Now, if for giggles and grins, we said, I don't know about, I don't know where to set it. I'm gonna set it in the middle. I'm gonna put it on the 10 foot ahead constant pressure line. Well, now I'm working way out here where the system curve intersects. Look at that, nine and a half GPM, just like we had before, all right? And my one single zone, I'm gonna be at a shade less than two gallons a minute. In terms of addressing the incredible shrinking delta T here, we haven't done very much, all right? We really haven't, we really haven't. If we go to five foot ahead, at least we know under design conditions, it's gonna be pretty close to 20. But as zone, as it gets warmer and warmer and warmer out, it's the delta T is gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller. In fact, here's three and a half gallons a minute, a little over foot ahead, that's 50% load. I want it to work here, it's gonna work there. Now my delta T won't be 20, my delta T will be 10. That's just the way it works, okay? Not bad, it's not the same as delta T, but it's certainly not bad, it's certainly not bad. Alrighty, and if we said, I don't know what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna turn it all the way up and get the hell out of here. Well now, two gallons a minute, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in terms of delta T, I'm, in, I'm in no different than where I was before with the fixed speed pump. The only difference is I'm gonna use about half the watts, all right? So I'm in electrical savings mode, but I'm not doing my system any favors. Nope. See folks, this is why we don't call them smart pumps. Cause I don't know, you know, that's not that smart. <laughs> okay. That's why we don't call them smart pumps. They are, they are interesting pumps. They are compelling pumps, but I, they're, they're a damn site. Uh, they're a damn far bit away from smart in my book. Is that right? How are we doing out there? We got any questions? Uh, we're doing okay. Yeah, it's looking good. Okay. Nope. Oh, here we go. I got one from Jose. Are you saying before the delta T will depend at you load and water speed or GPM? So by that been set, how are we going to? Uh, okay. I'm gonna uh, Jose. Could you reward that for me? I just want to make sure I understand where where you're going. Okay. Um, I, I'd like that. I'd like to. I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to know. Okay. I'd like to address that question. But if you could re if you could re uh, um, restate that for me, I'd appreciate it. All right. If you want, if you'd like them, I'm ready to go with the uh the random with the with the last week's winner. Tell you what, let's let's hold off because I want to do this part first. Let's hold off uh, when we got when when we um announce the winner of or the the answer to this week's trivia question. Okay. Is that right? You got it. Very good. All right, let's talk about now another Delta P pump. This is one we've we've had out for about a year with Bluetooth technology that we want to share with you. The 0018E. Uh, it, it, it's, it has two modes. It has, uh, you can use it without Bluetooth and just adjust the dial to the settings that you want, or with Bluetooth, it opens up a whole new world for you, as you're going to see tonight. Um, <clears throat> in, if you just use the dial, skip the Bluetooth, just use the dial, all right? 
over here on on the right hand side of the dial we have it's, it says zone circulator right there okay it says zone circulator if you're using this as a zone pump all right we already know a delta p pump's not going to vary its speed when used as a zone pump it's going to find its happy spot where the system curve intersects the performance curve and that's what it's going to do right that's what it's going to do <clears throat> With the 0018E, what we have is the ability to set the fixed speed that we want. And in this case, we can make it whatever speed we want, anywhere from this minimum speed right here, all the way up to the maximum speed up there. So we can set it up to be whatever fixed speed we want. How many speeds is that? Well, it's five to, to 44 watts. So if you go watt by watt, it's a 39 speed pump. All right. If you go every half watt, it's a 78 speed pump. How many freaking speeds do you need? OK, um, it's not a click, click, click thing. What it is, it's like a volume dial. As you turn it to the right, it goes up to 11, which is one louder. You see, it just gets a little bit faster. It gets faster as you turn it up to the right. So it's kind of like a volume dial. All righty. Uh, the next operating mode we have is zone valve. It's a, it's a, what it is. A, these are constant pressure modes. There's two constant pressure settings medium and high at 10 foot ahead and at 15 foot ahead all right two constant pressure settings and it says zv there for zone valves and then lastly you have trv thermostatic radiator valves when the pump's in continuous circulation and you have modulating control valves then and only then with a pump this size would you use the proportional pressure mode as we see here and uh, we have two settings there for medium and high as well as we have a declining performance curve, as flow goes down, the head loss or the head pressure differentiation, different, head pressure differential created by the circulator goes down as well, as it would in a parallel piped, you know, TRV home run type of system. So, where does that leave us? Well, we now have Bluetooth communication. We have Bluetooth communication with a mobile app. There's an app you can download from the App Store if you have an iPhone or from the Android Store if you have an Android. And it's the Takeo Pump App, Takeo 0018 Pump App. And now you have two-way communication. The pump will communicate to the app and the app will communicate to the pump. Uh, the app will communicate to the pump. And what it does now is it gives us four different operating modes, four different operating modes. Operating mode number one is what we call active adapt, and we'll discuss that in great detail, active adapt. Then you have your standard constant pressure setting, just like we have on the dial, but instead of two constant pressure lines to choose from, we have nine constant pressure lines to choose from. You're, you're showing proportional. Yes, that's what I meant to say, proportional pressure lines to choose from. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, you see these lines right here? Those are proportional lines. They're constantly proportional. <laughs> Sometimes when you talk and the brain doesn't check in with the other part of the brain to say, what did you just say? You need someone to say, you said you said constant and you meant proportional. Or I'll just shut up. Yeah, no, close. please don't. Please don't. That's no, don't do, don't, no, no, no. And somebody's got to uh, check a brick. Somebody's okay. got to check, keep me out. Someone's got to keep me in line. All right. Then we have the constant pressure settings. I was just getting ahead of myself. We have instead of two constant pressure settings like we would have on the dial for zone valves, we actually now have nine to choose from. There's nine constant pressure settings to choose from. And then we have an ad that adjustable fixed speed. And that adjustable fixed speed can be adjusted by using this slider. You simply put your finger on that slider and you can move it up and down and you can change the speed of the pump. Now in every one of these screens, you see this dot. That dot represents the actual operating point of the system at that moment. All right, that's kind of cool. You can see where your system's working. So say I've got this thing set at 20% speed and I'm way the heck out here, all right, I'm on the, on the far edge of that pump curve. And right now I look down here and it's telling me that pumps are pumping at 11.13 GPM at just under seven feet ahead. And at this point it's, it's like at 42 Watts. So what it's telling me is we're working kind of like so, all right? If we were to move that down a little bit, all right, it would move along this line to wherever we want it to be. What this thing is actually doing for you is it's actually giving you an idea of the system curve, all right? 
it's what it's doing is it's just putting that it's moving that intersection point along with your programming so you can actually see what's going on inside the pipe and i stole that line from dave dave credit where credit is due it's a great line and i've stolen it to the point where most people think i came up with it but, <laughs> but credit where credit is due all right so that's what the app will do for you now, how to set this up is setting up constant speed mode, all right? Setting up constant speed mode. Uh, first step is to get an idea of the load. Again, whether it's to do a heat loss analysis, whether it's to, you know, some guys will measure the baseboard and then compare that against the pipe size and see, well, it's gotta be about 30,000 BTUs because it's three quarter inch copper and I got 30,000 BTUs worth of, worth, of, worth of element up there. It's gotta be three gallons a minute. I, I mean, it can't be any more than that, that's for sure. Um, so you get an idea of the load and then you convert that load to flow rate 30,000 BTUs you convert it to flow rate using the universal hydronics formula GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500 and then you simply move this slider until this dot moves to where you want it to be so let's say we needed three gallons a minute you adjust this slider until this dot lines up on three gallons a minute somewhere on three gallons a minute. That's where it's gonna line up. The thing is, because it's working on the system curve, it's going to tell you the head loss. So you don't have to figure out the head loss. This will tell you the head loss at three gallons a minute. So let's say, you know, we, we move this slider and we intersect right about here, okay? We intersect right about here. So what it's gonna tell you is three gallons a minute at six feet ahead. So it's three at six. It's gonna, it's gonna that's where it's gonna work. And down at the bottom here, which you may, you know, where you see the readout here is going to show three gallons a minute at six feet ahead, and it'll tell you the current wattage. So all that information that that pops up once you set it up. So if you know the load, you can set this pump up about as well as a as a, as a fixed speed pump can be set up. All right. So you, under design conditions, the system, you know, the the, the pump's performance curve has been has been moved to meet the system requirement under design conditions which is all you can do with a fixed speed pump all right so just think about how easy that is now if we want to size this pump for a zone valve job all right we can size this pump for a zone valve job using the constant pressure mode there's nine settings here but the steps actually go back to the fixed speed mode so the first thing we need to do is get an idea of the total load, not zone by zone, but the total load. Again, using the same uh, uh, same uh, steps that we did before. Let's get an idea of that total load, all right? And then we convert the load to flow rate using the universal hydronics formula. So then we say 70,000 BTUs, 70,000 divided by 10,000 is gonna be seven gallons per minute, all right? So it's seven gallons per minute for exa an example. Then what I'll do is I'll switch to the blue mode, the constant speed mode, and I'll adjust this dial until this dot is on seven gallons a minute. So let's say it's at seven gallons a minute right there. I adjust it till I get to seven gallons a minute. Down below, it's gonna tell me what the head loss really is. All right, so all I gotta do is get, all, for, when using this pump, all I need to know is the flow. If I get an idea of the flow, it'll figure out the head for me and I can program it accordingly. So I can move that to seven gallons a minute. It's gonna tell me the head, all right? It'll indicate the head. Then I go back to constant pressure. And just by touching the screen, you can do this just by touching the screen, you can select different performance curves. So I simply touch, I'm, what I'm doing, you can't tell, I'm touching it right there. If I touch that screen, all right, I can go to the 10 foot ahead constant pressure line. And if I wanted to go to the one above it, I just touch that and boop, it'll jump up. I could also change it using these arrows, but it's more fun to touch the line you want. <laughs> so anyway, so that's how simple it is to, 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 to dial that in. Once you know the flow, go to the blue, it'll tell you the head, it'll tell you the head. So if, it's, if it was seven gallons a minute and only four feet ahead, I'd touch that line and I'm working down there. Again, about as well as a, as a circulator can be programmed. That's the beauty of the, of the, of the app, all right? So how are we doing out there, folks? What are we doing for time? Are we good? We are yep. good. 7.48. Yeah. All righty then. We got hours. Oh. We ain't going anywhere tonight. Yeah, there we go. All righty. <laughs> well, here's a good question. Does it pay to spend money on Delta T as opposed to Delta P? Andrew, that's a great question. 
And the answer is, it depends, <laughs> okay? It <laughs> depends. Um, it really depends. There's, it, it's, it depends on the size of the system, all right? The bigger the system, the bigger the difference, all right? The bigger the system, the bigger the difference, because you're gonna have more variable speededness with a Delta T pump on a bigger system. Um, as systems get smaller, the difference starts to get closer and closer and closer together to the point where maybe there's very little difference at all, all right? And in this case, like say with zone pumping, if I got a really small zone pump there, I need you know two gallons a minute at four feet ahead, I could set that up in del with my Delta P or my Delta T circulator, and it's gonna run at minimum speed almost all the time. I could also set that up using the app with a 0018E, get it at two gallons a minute at four feet ahead, dead on accurate. And I'm, I'm at a little less money than a Delta T pump, but it's gonna work about the same. So sometimes there's a big difference, sometimes there's a medium sized difference, and sometimes there's very little difference at all, if that makes sense to you, all right? <laughs> so uh, what is the effect of outdoor reset on Delta T, asked Robert O'Brien, virtually none. It's, it doesn't care what the water temperature is. It doesn't fight with, people say, oh, it's gonna fight, they're gonna fight together. No, they don't fight together. It's a pump for goodness sake. It's a, it's a very benign, non-aggressive, peace-loving, uh, you know, conscientious, conscientious objector type pump. It doesn't wanna fight with anybody. All it wants to do is check what the water temperature is going out and send water back to the boiler a prescribed amount lower, typically 20. It, there's no fighting involved. There's no fighting involved. I don't know where that stuff comes from. Um, there's, you know, there's it, 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 people talk about, well, you know, you, you, the, as the del as it gets warmer out, the delta T gets smaller, but that that's important because you got to have some heat. And they talk about, you know, lowering flow rates and all that other nonsense, which is just what it is. Uh, it's one of the things that's technically correct, but we've got minimum speed, man. <laughs> Let's not forget that. Um, so really, I guess a short answer to a, a long answer to a short question: there is no effect. Delta T doesn't affect, uh, Delta T doesn't affect outdoor reset. Outdoor reset doesn't affect Delta T pumping. If you understand, if you truly understand what Delta T pumping is trying to do, it's clear there's really no, there's no fighting going on here. Alrighty then, good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. Alrighty. Plenty, plenty of stuff coming in now, question wise. Right. So. so what do we got? Uh, how accurate is the GPM head loss of the app output in the past designs? I've found this to be inaccurate without Delta P feedback. That's from Darren. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're claiming that as long as you're in the sweet spot that we're within about 5%, which is good as any balancing valve or anything else out there. Um, again, you're way up to the left or you're way out to the right. The accuracy goes down on that. But um, uh, maybe you know, we covered how we get that uh, inferred information in one of these sessions, didn't we? Right. It, again, it's what it, it's it's yeah. inf it's basically that amp draw and the resistance against the impeller, and that's that you want the algorithm. I'm not the guy. No. <laughs> okay. You know yeah. that 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 that's math that's above my pay grade and and my IQ. Um, but you know, from we 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 we, we had a we had a session on that uh, internally, and they explained how it how how it worked, and it made a lot of sense. But it's basically inferring from RPM and resistance. Um, it's kind of con doing some math calculations to convert it. I think Rick is right on it. About five percent within you know plus or minus you know a couple you know plus or minus a couple two and a half percent for a total of five. I think that's in the sweet spot. I think that's about as good as you can do. Yep, our our first versions of circulators that were giving us flow didn't give us head at all, but it gave us flow. Uh, we were plus or minus thirty percent. Now, if anybody remembers the the old yellow pumps out there, so oh, yeah. we we knew we were, you know, getting kind of close, but uh, that was the best we could do at the time. But obviously, we've gotten better with the software, and 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 in those days, we didn't even list what the GPM was on the circuit itself. So until we got better at it, so we we got there, but we didn't want to give you bad information out there. So, I mean, I had a circulator work in my house for a couple of years on 0.0, .0 GPM. <laughs> Works really good. Fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, when is it best to use Delta P and when is it best to use Delta T? Um, I, my, my short answer to that is in every instance, you're going to find Delta T to be a superior pump. But as we said before, some cases it's a big difference. 
some cases it's a, a medium sized difference, some cases it's a little difference, in some cases there's no difference. Um, so it's not that you no, know, this application is best for Delta P and this application is best for Delta T. I think they, it's just a matter of you know you've got you know you've got good, which is a good properly sized regular standard efficiency pump. You got better, which is Delta P, and you got best, which is Delta T. Again, it goes back to the va how much value are you getting for the extra cost of the Delta uh, the Delta T pump? Uh, again, smaller system. Not as much of a difference, not as much of a variable, variable speed variation. Uh, the, the, the value may be, a, may be somewhat dubious there. It, it, you may not be, you know, you may be spending a lot more money, but you may not be getting that much, that much benefit from it. So that, that's kind of how I would look at it. Provided, go ahead. Provided you, uh, you program your delta P pump appropriately. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Rick. No, it's fine. Um, um, well, it keeps shifting on me. Um, Oh, Mike uh, Lampkin, uh, if you, um, I think you've got a bigger um, blow up of the actual curve, but his question is, uh, Mike, if you look real close, you can see at 12 gallons a minute, you follow that up to maximum speed, you're right at about six feet ahead. So hopefully that answers your question. So. Okay. Yeah, he's looking right about here, right? 12 gallons a minute. Yeah. Six feet ahead. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Now we have that active adapt thing, and uh, active adapt is, you know, it's it's something that 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 Taco has had with Taco Italia for many many years. Um, this isn't something you know, a, 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 you know, an, an adapt come lately. It's something we've had for quite a while. It's really, it it's really a very it's for European style systems. And and the reason I bring this up is because everybody says, well, it's like auto adapt, right? It, it, it's exactly like auto adapt, but not too many people know what either really does. And it has fallen into that myth that we talked about earlier of you press the magic button and it figures everything out for you. Oh, that it were so, but it is not. Okay. It's not, that's not what it does. That's not what either of them do. So let's talk about where it came from. Uh, both came from your typical European style heating system. And a typical European style heating system has large panel radiators in each room. And in the most case, it's a two pipe system, meaning a supply and return to each radiator, a supply to one radiator, then a dedicated return right back to a central manifold. It's almost like a home run system, if you will, for each radiator. Um, each, the output of each radiator is controlled by a thermostatic radiator valve. The thing that is tasked with maintaining the comfort level in the room is about an inch and a half to two inches away from the hottest thing in the room. But hey, what do I know? Um, it's kind of just what it does. They work fine. I mean, it's a very, it's a, it's a very good system. But generally speaking, traditionally for those European systems, they have one pump and the pump runs continuously. It runs 24/7. Uh, they turn it on in September. They turn it off in May. All right. It, and it's not because it's better to run the pump 24-7. Lord knows it isn't because a pump running 24-7 is like leaving lights on all the time. It eats up electricity. The reason they do it is they don't use thermostats. They don't have a thermostat on the wall that tells the boiler to fire or the pump to fire. All right. The pump runs all the time. The TRVs modulate to control the temperature in the room or the comfort level in the room. Why is that the most common system in Europe? It's because that's the way they've always done it. Why is that the way they've always done it? Well, they, that's when when they first started installing hydronic systems, they were they were nine times out of ten they were retrofits into really old houses back in the 60s, and that was the easiest way to install the system. It's not like they did a complete analysis of all the hydronic options. Oh, this one is the best. We shall use this one. It is the most efficient and everything else. No, it was the easiest to do. They're, they're, not, they're not a whole heck of a lot different than we are. So, if you have in that situation, if you have a pump that's too big or too small, both create issues. If the pump's too big, the TRVs are mostly closed, and that gives you poor heat delivery and comfort. If the TR, if the pump is too small, the TRVs are mostly open, which also is it, poor heat delivery and comfort. Okay, it's just not very consistent. It's not terribly consistent in either respect. What with Active Adapt, what Active Adapt basically does is the pump needs to run for a while to figure stuff out. And then what it does is it, it, it will assess changing pressure differentials as those TRVs modulate. And over time, over an extended period of time, it will determine the best proportional delta P, 
delta p curve for that system and will change as necessary all right but it's it's not this magic i'm going to do a complete system assessment and then every time something happens i'm going to automatically change so you always get the right thing that's a that just doesn't that's not how it works all right uh, the best uh, analogy i've heard for this is it helps the system stay within the hash marks if you can envision a football field all right rather than playing from sideline to sideline okay you you really kind of you keep the syst you keep the trvs mostly in a consistent position and they just open and close just a little bit so the game stays in between the hash marks as opposed from going from sideline to sideline with with wild variations in both flow and in comfort all right and i'll show you a picture in a minute that well i'm going to show you a picture right now okay it's going to look kind of like this all right what what active adapt does is it is it pushes the it makes the field narrower all right so instead of instead of you know we're bouncing along like this i'm spending a lot of time over here then i'm over here and i'm over here and, and doing all that what it's doing is it's pushing it's it's shrinking the field and now we're kind of bouncing off a much smaller field and it makes for much more consistent heat delivery and and the pump will adjust its speed accordingly to make sure that the, that the trvs aren't opening all the way and then all of a sudden they have to close real quick opening and closing and opening and closing i don't know if that's i i hope that's a good visual for you of what we're trying what we try to accomplish with active adapt all right so what does it all mean if you're going to use this thing in that type of a system if you're going to use this thing in that type of a system well the first time the system the pump comes on it's got to run for 90 minutes at its default setting, which is gonna be this, this setting right here. It's gonna run at 90 minutes for that default setting to analyze the system, to get a good idea of what's going on. Then there's another 30 minutes on top of that for system stabilization, and that's when the algorithm kicks in. Then it says, do I have to go up? Do I have to go down? Where should I go? Where should I go? All righty. What is it that makes it adapt? Well, it needs to see it needs to see changes in flow. It needs to see a change in flow for at least 20 minutes. If the, if the load is stable, meaning we've been up and running for quite a while, it needs to see a change in flow for 60 minutes before it's gonna jump from one to the other, all right? Under normal circumstances, we're gonna be bopping back and forth across this line as the TRVs modulate. Okay, as TRVs close, we're gonna come down here. As TRVs open, we're gonna come up here. If there's a big change in flow, like all of a sudden I got a, I've got a, a 1.3 gallons per minute more flow than 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 I had before, all right, and that goes on for for a good 60 minutes, then it'll jump up one if it needs to, if it needs to, or jump down if it needs to. It might jump down to here, okay. So again, it's it under. Under normal operating conditions, all right, how does it feel? Like we said before, it's resistance against the impeller. Uh, as TRVs <clears throat> open, the load is going up. There's less resistance against the impeller. The, 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 that's a signal for the impeller, for the pump to speed up. And as TRVs close, decreasing load, it's vice versa. It goes the other way. So ideally, what you're after is some sort of steady state operation that looks like that. More, more often than not, you're bopping back and forth here. Under some situations, all right, maybe I'll have to drop down and start working on this line. And then I'll, if I'm running way up here at a long period of time, well, then bang, I'll jump right up there. So those are the, those, that's kind of, that's active adapt and everything like it in a nutshell. Um, again, what you have, okay, maybe this is, this right here is this right here, all right? We're trying to get it to move in there. All right, that's maybe that's the best way to the best way to uh, to uh, to show it. All righty, and again, let's think about this for a second. And how how would we use that? What would what would it look like? Let me go back here. What would it look like? I'll go back one more here. Boom, boom, boom. What would this look like? Hello, wrong one. We'll try that again. What would it look like? <laughs> If we were using this in a zone valve system, okay, let's do seven gallons a minute at five foot ahead. This is where I need to be. Rick, where is it going to work when we first turn it on? 
Rick? Rick is quiet. Dave, where's it going to work when we first turn this thing on? <laughs> Go ahead. I need to be here, right? But yep. if I'm in Active Adapt and I turn this thing on, where's the system going to work? It's up, it's operating up at uh, six and a half at uh, at about eleven foot ahead. Yeah, right there. It's going to operate that on that default curve that it goes into for an hour and a half, right? So if we were to extrapolate out the system curve, I'm working right here, yep. full speed. Okay, maybe at about 10 oh, gallons a minute. Sorry. That's where she's working, right? It's gonna work right there. And as zones close, this is what it's gonna be doing. Yep. And it's gonna be working here and here and here and here and here. And because this is an on, now this is an on off system, Guys, is it ever not going to work on that line? The answer no, would be on, no. Yeah, depends <laughs> on how long the call is. Yeah, it depends on if 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 this thing's running for 90 minutes. It's got to run for 90 minutes to figure anything out. If we don't give it that those 90 minutes to figure something out, it's never going to do anything different anyway. And that's in an on-off system, right? Um, 90, I'd say 95% of the time, if you put this on a zone valve system and you put it in active adapt nine i'd say 95 percent of the time you will never get it to operate anywhere but here i i i absolutely believe that i don't think it'll ever work anywhere but on that line because when it right. shuts off it goes right back to that line now it will vary at speed and you'll see the watch draw will change yes absolutely right, so you go into assume that it's learning something it's just operating like a zone valve system yeah right it's operating here and here that's still going to be full speed fixed speed at 44 watts but yeah. over here i'm operating at a lower speed over here i'm operating at a lower speed so yeah you're going to see these the speed change and the watt draw wattage change and you think well it's got to be doing what it's supposed to be doing right well it's just working on that line and that's true of anybody any 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 any, any fill in the blank adapt that's kind of how it works all right if this thing runs for a hell of a long time and you put it into some sort of mode where you have constant circulation for a hell of a long time you may see it drop down here but again it, when it shuts off it's going to go back to the default so it's not what you think it is it's not what most people believe it to be we want to believe that there's such great technology out there that if we press the button this thing will figure everything out for us and we don't have to know we can let the pump do the thinking for us this takes the thinking out of it i've heard these words from people and it, it just makes your skin crawl because it's a it's not how it works and b what do you have what are you going to do if you have to push the button again right <laughs> you know it's 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 better to know than not know again the only time i think you'd see you would use this in on this pump uh, th a pump this size, the only time you would use it is if you had continuous circulation with modulating radiator valves, thermostatic radiator valves. That's the only time you'd use this 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 uh, this this operating mode. All righty, how we doing, people? We are cruising. Oh, wait a minute. We want to go back here. The trivia answer, and I love this line. You're a daisy if you do. The trivia answer is gun mounts and heat exchangers. We make gun mounts and heat exchangers. Gun mounts for the Navy and heat exchangers, well, for the Navy, for them big boats that they had the guns mounted on. How many of you knew that? Did we have a lot of good, did we have a lot of people that get the right answer there, Dave? I saw quite a few. Dave's making the list, so. Yep, I got about 12. I got about 12 right. that had both parts uh, correct. There was a few that I, so to speak, gave it to you. <laughs> There you go. So that's that's part seven. And like I said, we got a ton of questions here. We want to pick the winner for next week. So we're going to be on here, guys, as long as you want. Um, but just so you know what's up next for next week, part eight, we're going to be talking about buffer tanks and how that can help with the short cycling as well. When you combine a buffer tank and a Delta T pump, oh, no, we got a system, man. Uh, and then piping up modulating condensing boilers, one of the things you know, Rick Rick Mayo is one of the one of the, the foremost experts in our business on 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 piping and controlling ModCon boilers. So uh, we'll 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 be jumping into that next week extensively. And I hope I didn't overpromise on you there, Rick. 
<laughs> That's like, first I heard of it. So uh, yeah, there you go. So <laughs> this is this is delegation by surprise. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> hey, I gave you a week this time. Okay. That's right. That's right. It wasn't like, hey, what are you doing like in three minutes? What are you doing in three minutes? You're good. You're yeah. you're in charge. <laughs> yeah. So that will be what we're going to be talking about next week. And uh, Dave, are you? Do you have your names ready for to, to select the winner from last week? And then we'll jump into all these questions. I do. I'm going to do it this way. Oh, and real quickly, uh, contact contact Dave on uh, Takeo Training on Instagram if you want stickers. 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 Yeah. If you want stickers. Talk to Dave on Takeo, at Takeo Training on Instagram. Uh, he guarantees he'll get them to you before he gets them to Rick Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> Still waiting. Yep. Still All waiting, right. baby. All right. I'll check it out. So, well, from last week, we had about 50 people answer the question correctly. So, large amount of people um, answered our questions last week. What was our question last week? Oh, the uh, question now. was, um, what was our question? Elizabeth, oh, where were we? Elizabeth? Elizabeth, yeah. New Jersey. Where did we That's operate right. from? Elizabeth, Elizabeth New, Jersey. New Jersey, correct. Yeah, so we had about 50 people answer that correctly, so I have them all loaded into this wheel, and I hope this app works. So uh, maybe if you sh stop sharing your screen, John, this will uh, pop well, they, in. They can click on your screen and blow it up, so I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Uh, yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. I am? Yeah, you, you still are, got you walking across the old Abbey Road. I said, I don't want to share my, but I don't want to share my screen. Hey, there, there you go. go. No All one right. can see my screen. There we go. All right, so let me click on the wheel to spin it out. Let's see who wins. Oh, boy, this is going to go slow, isn't it? Uh, shouldn't be that bad. All right, there, there we go. go. And the winner from la last week, we got a 007E, correct? That's correct. And the winner popped up as Steve Weiland, but the he wheel just, says no. He just no. texted me and said, "Do not, do not." So let me remove that name out of here, and yeah. we will do it again. We'll do another quick spin here. All right, be, and took him out of there. I typed it in, but I didn't uh, delete his name. No manufacturers. <laughs> so let's see who gets it now. Our big winner is going to be Mr. John Allen. Woohoo! All right, John, I will send you an email and uh, our um, what we're giving away this week. Oh, no, that was last week. That was for the 0070. Right. So we will uh, we'll get your address and we will send you a 007E out to your system uh, to plug into your house. So excellent, excellent. Let me turn that back now. All righty. And this week we are going to be uh, giving away. What are we giving away this week? This week, I am going into the um, storage locker and pulling out some, uh, I got some uh, Taco hoodies. I got Ooh. some nice black one, a green one, um, and some Taco hats that we're going right. to put in there. So, yes. We, we might have several winners then next week. Very possible. I got to take a look in the box and see what we got up there at the factory. Like I said, I haven't been there since um, November, so I got to get somebody to go dig into my boxes and find out what's in there. Very good. Very good. All right. So we got 170 people still online. And uh, got, uh, we have actually, we've got a lot of questions here that we want to get to. But I guess I'll ask you guys this out there in the audience. Do you want to see a demonstration of the 0018E? Dave has a 0018E hooked up to a demo model. And he can share, he can show his app on the screen. So if you guys have an interest, just type in a little, yeah, why not up there. Oh, yes, we have many people said yes already. Okay. So, yeah, Dave, um, why don't you, you guys can, why don't you guys walk through that? I'll I'll uh, stop sharing my webcam for a bit, and then you guys have all of the, uh, all the, uh, all the bandwidth. Okay. So, I'm going to change it over to, to me being the presenter. So, show my screen. And, JB, you're still, I could still, you could still hear me though, right? Yep. I can still hear you, and I see your screen. What screen do you see? Take go after see, dark. Take go after dark with all of the icons. Desktop. Let's see. Okay. Say. Let me do this then. How about this? Now. Now we yep. see. All right. Reflector. We got it working. 
reflector yeah this is an app this is an app that i just downloaded so um after this i'm probably going to purchase it so i can get rid of this thing here so right behind here you could see um i don't know if my camera's still up but you can see behind me i'm hooked up to that circulator right there with this ipad all right already set up in there and you can see we are in the zone circ mode and you can see that two ways one by the app here but two if you look at the circulator we've got a blue light on the circulator telling us we're in the zone circ mode we are running about 15 percent speed and there's your actual operation point you scan behind here and i can see it at 2.6 gallons a minute and it's at 3.28 foot ahead running six watts at 2000 rpm that the system is doing so i can just go right onto my app and i can grab the slider bar and speed it up so it's going to find the curve again it's just it's hunting back and forth but if you notice it's going to follow that system curve as it goes straight up the line there and so that's 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 basically plotting out your system curve more or less Right, exactly. And if I bring it out to 100%, then we're going to see it hit the outside curve. All right, and I kind of, oh, I know what happened. I'm out of the 30-minute uh, timeout period. So right now, the, the, the circulator has a 30-minute timeout, which means while you're communicating to it, if you um, just walk away from it, it's not going to communicate anymore. Uh, you can do only uh, read only out of it. You're not read right to the Bluetooth app. And I can tell that when you look at the app, everything is kind of grayed out at the top. So you see it says zone circ, zone valve, TRV, active. I can't select that. So you just have to come to the dial, take it out of Bluetooth for a second, put it back in, and it's going to reset itself. And you should see everything light back up again like it just did. Yep. So now we're running full 100% speed. You see um, where it's trying to hunt in there and find where it's supposed to be at. Click on zone valve mode. And now you can see all the different curves available to you. And it's slowing down because the last time I was using the zone valve mode, I had set it for uh, just about six foot ahead here. So that's the curve that it's lit up on. You can see that curve is nice and dark. You just tap the curve and the circulator is going to speed up. You'll also see the light changed on the circulator. I didn't touch the dial. We're in the Bluetooth setting on the dial, and now we're at uh, just about 12 foot ahead on the system. Or you can hit the arrows going back and forth to up and down the different curves. Here is your TRV mode. And the TRV mode is showing um, a curve seven, but I can also change those different curves and you'll see the watt draw and the RPMs uh, start changing on there. One of the nice things about this too is it's showing you the number of working hours this system has. So you'll see on the screen how, many, how long it's run, how many cycles it's gone through today, total power consumption, and if you had any alarms. And the alarms are your sure start if we have it, if it's dirty um, or it has air in the system. And it'll record those. So this way, if you need to, you might want to consider putting in uh, a magnetic separator, dirt separator in your system, or check your air um, and, and pressure in the system. So that's going to be on the alarm side of things. <clears throat> and then also, here you go with the active adapt. Now, if you happen to notice a lot of shutdowns, it has cycled a lot then that means whatever program you set it for, it may be cycling way too much. So you might be able to slow it down and get it down to a slower speed because it has been running or uh, very short run times out of it. So um, that's what you need to look at there. <clears throat> All right, couple other things I wanna point out in here. If we click on the three tabs um, towards the top left corner, we get into our menu and your menu shows you, you can change the circular. You can only talk to one at a time in the system itself. So you can change the circ if you've got multiples on one project, you can change the names of them. That would be under uh, a different area, not under change pumps, but you would choose that under settings. Um, you can change your pump name if you see here, so you can give it anything you'd like. 
uh, you know, zone pump one, second floor, you know, master suite, whatever you want to call it. Mo, Larry, or Curly? Yeah, if you know which one's Mo and which one's Curly. Yeah, if you got three zones, Mo, Larry, and Curly makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that left to right or right to left? Certainly. That's right. <laughs> um, here's another thing that's cool in here. When you take a look at the reporting, and the reporting, I can go ahead and create a commissioning report. So let's go ahead and choose a uh, new report. And what it's going to do is pull in today's date and time. You can type in your own information into here, and you're going to create this entire commissioning report out of the system itself. Um, it's pulling in GPS. So right now it pulled in my address. All right, so don't look at that. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's where I am. That's the, that's the secret lair. Nuts. Everybody knows where I am now. So um, I can't, uh, let's see here. It's acting a little slow on my iPad right now. Too many things going on, but you would type in all the information and you create a commissioning report based upon where you had last left this. All right, I'm not gonna, I can't get any further on there right now. It might be having something to do with the app uh, using to share on my computer screen. And then it, the, the, the reports that you create are kept on your device. They are not kept on the circulator. So when you create the report, you can always email that out to yourself, to your customer, keep it at the job site. Um, but it is not kept on the device. The only thing that is kept on the device is going to be this information here that you see under working hours, shutdowns, and, and total power consumption that you see. You mean can, yeah, kept on the circulator? Kept on the circulator, did I say this? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see. Any questions that we have out there? Yeah. Let's see. What guys? What questions do you have, guys? Yeah. There's a few here. Uh, do you need to purchase? Uh, whoops. I'm sorry. Do you need to purchase the app? I answered that. Yep. Yep. Nope. The app is free. It's just a, it's a free download. Okay. So you don't need to purchase the app. Um, this is uh, asked about B, uh, BMS, BMS or other data ports. Nope, it's not that. It's not that kind of a circulator. It's just talking to the app to make it, uh, you know, for residential applications to make it, uh, uh, to make it more, more user friendly and more adjustable for, for these, uh, for these, um, these types of systems. So again, another one can just work with building management systems. Again, Bluetooth just communicates with the app. It's, it's just a very simple thing to for normal installations to be able to fine tune that circulator for that system uh, about as about as best as we can. Um, are we gonna do this with the 007E? No plans at this time to do that with the 007E, Robert, but you know, it's, it, 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 cause there's some people just want super simple, you know? So not really sure, but in the, with the 0018E, it's, you know, uh, it, the, the benefit of this is that it's, it's, gives us a lot of adjustability to be able to do some fine tuning. 0070 is 10 foot ahead constant pressure line. There's not a lot of not a lot of options there in terms of setup. So value might not be, you know, it'd be nice to see what's going on inside the system, but that that's about the extent of it. So right. it's possible, but it, uh, it it's it really does it, the 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 bluetooth really starts to sparkle and shine when we get into a multifunction circulator that, that gives you some options on how you want to set it up. Uh, one of the questions I said is, why did the red, the dot flash to red briefly? And it was probably under the zone circ when I was speeding it up and down um, and I was changing it quickly. That just means it was, it was finding which curve to operate on, where am I? Um, so it just took a while to learn. So um, like I just went from 100% down to 37 and the dots hunting all over the screen. And usually when I start at low and go to high, well, I see it go to red or uh, when I've got low flow on the system. So right now I've got all three zones open and that's when it's going to, uh, it's looking for it. So I find it's on the low flow when I get down to that 10% range and then crank it up. And and it's closer to the left side of the curve compared to the right side. Do I find that red dot? So all of a sudden, that's all it is. It's just the software trying to find where it is at the moment, and it kind of goes out of the curve. 
Hey, Dave, will you be my hands? I want to give them another scenario and some things I've taught on this as well. Uh, sure. Under the fixed speed application, and you got it maxed all the way out, and it takes a, a few, I don't know, seconds, maybe 10, 15 seconds to find its happy spot. That would be hydraulic equilibrium, and it's sitting right there nice and steady. Now, this is for those jobs. Let's set the scenario. It's midnight. It's New Year's Eve. You're not going to do any calculations. You, you don't have no idea what the GPM requirement is, uh, but you're pulling out one old pump, fixed speed pump, and you're putting in this new high zoot pump, and it's a zone valve application. Okay, so we got the moose antlers. We got a you know, certain number. I mean, we got five zone valves uh, uh, supply. We got five dedicated returns coming back. So all I'm trying to do is get an idea of what the actual system resistance is. So that's why we open up all the zones manually. We turn it all the way up to 100%, and we just kind of see where it settles out. And what I would recommend you do at that point in time is it gives you an idea. This particular uh, test unit that Dave has behind him has about, uh, what is what would you say that is, about uh, 14, 13 or 14 foot ahead, right? Yep. Well, well 14, that's, with, yeah. that's with everything open, that's with everything calling, and you're normally not going to need that. So, Dave, if you would uh, touch the zone valve button, what I would recommend you do is go down one step, so touch that next lower uh, button, lower, the other lower. Okay, bring it one more, where it was. Well, no, it was just under 12. Now take it down uh, to one more. Uh, maybe that's what it was where you had set it. Uh, so what it's going to do now is it's as the zone valves, as you start closing them manually, you're going to see that thing go left to right. And again, that's a midnight, no time to do anything, need to get the pump in there, but I want to get it in the right mode of operation. I'm just kind of getting a sense of what the resistance of the system is at balls to the wall. And the reason I'm saying this is because how many times do we need everything that system's got to offer? Most systems are oversized. That's why I'm saying it's better to go underneath. You'll get more movement from left to right uh, the farther down you go with that. So anyway, recommendation for, uh, you know, like I said, New Year's Eve, uh, and you want to get in and out of there and set it up. Okay, you have no idea what the GPM is. You're not going to take the time to do the calculation. You just want to get the pump set up. So um, it's worked quite well, as a matter of fact. Excellent. Very good. Uh, yeah, one of the questions came in, is it for iPhones and Android? Yes, definitely. It's on both uh, both applications, both both platforms you can use it on. So. Scott Carrington says the best Western is paint your wagon. Eh, wrong. No, it's not paint your wagon. The best Western, also the greatest Western ever made, also happens to be the greatest movie ever made. That might be a good hint. <laughs> Think about that. Best Western is also the best movie. So there's something for you to put to... To, to, to contemplate over the next several days. There you go. ECM pumps and ferrous metals. Is it affecting pump life expectancy? Asked Gordon Ramberg. Not ours. Uh, not ours. Um, we've kind of, we talked a little bit about it last week, Gordon, and we'll, talk, we'll mention it again. Um, the concern about ECM pumps is ECM is an electronically commutated motor. Uh, part of the start of, part of the, uh, uh, the mutating of the electronically commune, but whatever it is, is the part that makes that that happen is a permanent magnet, always on magnet. And you see Dave holding it right up there with some some screws connected to it. That's a permanent earth magnet that's in there, and that does half the work of the system already. So we don't have to create the magnet. So that's one of the reasons it uses less electricity. Now you've got a permanent always on magnet in there, and you have water circulating through the pump that also has a lot of black iron oxide or you know magnetic crapola that's in the system and you want to make sure that uh, that you protect that permanent magnet from the magnetic crapola we have two ways of doing that first we have um what dave is showing there called a bio barrier bio barrier it's a bio stands for black iron oxide it's a brass mesh barrier 
that will allow water to go in when you first fill up the system. And there's not a constant exchange of fluid after that. That's really not how they work. But that black, uh, uh, that, that bio barrier is made of brass and it basically makes that, makes that um, magnet invisible to the magnetic crapola that's in the water. So it's not gonna be drawn into the inner workings of the circulator. It's just not gonna happen. That's part one. Part two of the fail safe is what we call shore start, which if the rotor were to ever become locked up for whatever reason, it's the, the circulator knows it's supposed to be going. So what happens is we go into shore start mode. And what happens is we it, the, the control will rock that impeller back and forth very aggressively, 44 watts that way, 44 watts that way to try to break it free. And it'll do this up to 100 cycles over a 20 minute time frame to try to break itself free. And in the real world, out there in the wild, we've seen it break free, what guys, about two, three, four at the most cycles before it breaks itself free. Uh, if it's after a hundred cycles, that means something's really foobarred in there. There's a stick or something in it that's keeping that thing from rolling. Uh, then what happens is rather than keep the torque on the motor and burn out the motor, the pump just says, I'm done. You know, I'm gonna shut off, kill the power, the LED is gonna turn red, and that's a signal for someone to come and fix me. So, so in that case, so with both of those, no, our ECM circulators uh, aren't really, we don't, you know, the black, black iron oxide and other metal crapola really don't affect ours. Others that can't may, may not be able to make that same statement, but ours, we're okay, you know, we're fine with it. Go ahead, Dave's gonna show oh, us. I was gonna say, I've got a circulator here that I've uh, threw a cord on and i've got a power supply a, a switch on here and i'm gonna hold the impeller i pulled the casing off of here so if i turn this thing on it's gonna try and run and you're gonna see the light under normal operation ramps up to speed it's not going anywhere i'm holding it tight with two thumbs on it it stops you get a red and a white flashing light which means all right i'm gonna shake it back and forth and then go up to full speed. So I'm gonna hold it close to the microphone so you can hear this thing operating. I can feel it a heck of a lot. That's up to full speed. That's like 5,000 RPM right now. And then it stops. There's the shake. And then it goes back up to that 5,000 RPM. I can't hold this for too long, so I usually have to stop by now so because <laughs> it hurts its little hands <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> andrew bennett says butch cassidy and the sundance kid close andrew that's number three on the list of best westerns it's a terrific movie uh but no it's not number one jeff house actually got it and jeff you know this because every time i see you we talk about it it's the magnificent seven the original with yul brenner steve mcqueen uh robert vaughn uh uh, to, to Charles Coburn, um, uh, who else is it? Uh, Coburn, you got the, the the guy from Germany. Uh, oh God, now I'm gonna now I'm gonna blanking out here. Okay, Charles Bronson, um, Horst Buchholz, and the guy that played Harry Luck. Oh God, it's gonna bug me. Brad Dexter, there you go, Brad Dexter. There's your Magnificent Seven. Well, it, it wasn't Blazing Saddles. No, it wasn't Blazing South. Very funny movie, but no, it wasn't Blazing South. And it wasn't Gone with the Wind. It wasn't War Wagon. No, it wasn't The Three Amigos, Anthony. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, Telly Savalas wasn't in, wasn't in the, uh, the Magnificent Seven. He was in um, that movie with uh, Clint Eastwood, where they went to go get the gold behind Nazi lines. That was a great, with Don Rickles. That was a great movie. That was a great movie. And it wasn't Cat Baloo. Cat Baloo is not a bad movie, though. <laughs> All righty. What other questions do we have out there, boys and girls? Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, also an excellent movie. Yes, definitely, yes. Oh, now it's going to bug me. The mo I just saw it a couple weeks ago. Clint Eastwood, they were trying to get the, they were going behind Nazi lines to, to steal a bunch of gold. It was Clint Eastwood, it was uh, uh, Don Rickles was in it, Savalas, and a whole bunch of other people. Oh, gosh. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Kelly's Heroes. Thank you, Daniel. That's what it was. That's right. Kelly's Heroes. Very good. Everybody's got it. Oh, Rocky's got it. Anthony's got it. You guys, you're after my heart. I love it. 
Does Taco make a programmable temperature controller aquastat for a dry well application to close the TT on the boiler? Does Taco make a programmable temperature controller aquastat for a dry oh just, so just like an aquastat? Um, I sent him an answer on that already. Oh, you did? Yeah, not at this time. So no, not at this time. Not at this time. Hey, Rocky, thanks for joining us, man. Hope you're hope all is well up there in Fairbanks. Has the snow melted? And is there is there still snow in Fairbanks? That's a good question. All right. Well, guys, let's keep the questions coming. Again, this has been interesting. We've we've gone to uh, we've gone through to uh, you know to to 9:30 on a couple of occasions. Uh, last week we were done around nine. Right now it's about 8:30, and we'll stay on as long as you guys want. So let's open it up to any and all questions you guys may have. There's 132 of you left. So if you got questions. We're happy to answer. If you don't, well, we're happy to say, give, bid you an early good evening, but whatever you guys want, uh, we're here to serve you. Uh, Rocky says, snow's gone. As, the snow is gone at his house, which is all that matters. <laughs> That's right. There you go. There you go. Yep. And any customer's houses that he has to go to, that's all that matters too. Yes. That's all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. Fairbank, actually, Fairbanks in the spring is a beautiful city. You've been up there, Rick, right? Well, you used yeah. to live up there. Well, you lived in, in Anchorage, right? Yep. Yep. Very good. Do, 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 do. I saw a YouTube for mechanical hum. <laughs> hub. Mechanical hub. hub. Thank you. Yeah. No, it says hum. I'm sorry. It says I hum know. right here. I know. I know. <laughs> about ProPress. What's your thoughts about as far as code and quality? Ah, very good question. Gentlemen, why don't you take the first part? How do you, uh, what are your thoughts on ProPress? Because this is cool. We don't sell it, so we can say whatever we want. Well, we sell fitting. Well, we sell products well, we do. With yeah. pro, that are ProPress compatible. Yes. Right, right, right. Yep. I mean, it's it's just as good as anything else out there. I mean, I know people are 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 scared of it taking the skill out of sweating copper pipes and you know and and making it too easy. But but our job is to not necessarily sweat pipes but build systems. So that's the way I look at it. And however connection system is is you're comfortable with and works for you guys is go for it. Um, I know everybody always, you know, you know, the three of us here on the screen, we all came together from another company, all right, doing PEX pipes, all right, and we used to get that all the time. And one of the things I remember hearing from John in the in the early days was, imagine if PEX was first, and the copper guy came along and tried to show you how to make a new style connection, you would think you guys were crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, because of, yep. of going from uh, from a system with no fire and solder and flux and, and all the stuff in there. Um, so I think it's it's whatever you're most comfortable with and, and get the job done. Here's so another analogy yeah. along the same lines. Imagine if you, you older uh, people that have done uh, uh, no hub, right? What, what if no hub pipe was out there before service weight? SV, and somebody came along with a ladle and a caulking iron and, <laughs> and a, a, a rope and all that stuff. You know, same long same line as what Dave just said. You know, it's just, hey, uh, uh, well, hold on a second, I got something for you. What's it called? Yeah, you know what's coming. <laughs> what are you doing, Rick? <laughs> I'm addressing <laughs> evil people. Yes. Evil, evil or die. Okay. Evolve or die. That's right. That's right. That's right. I get, yeah, my, my, my uncle Frank was a great pipe fitter, man. He could, he could pipe the butt off of anything. He was fantastic. Um, he did the work. My dad ran the company and, um, and my dad worked too, obviously, but that's kind of how, how they work. But uh, I remember my uncle Frank, the only time in my life I, I ever left him speechless was he was watching us do some, some, some drain pipe once. And he says, yeah, you kids, you got it so easy. All you need to do plumbing nowadays is a handsaw, a level, and a can of glue. <laughs> I said, Uncle Frank, who the hell uses a level? Yeah. <laughs> and at that, that you moment, it, he opened his mouth, he looked at me, and went, I, I, I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a guy, he never believed in cleaner. To his dying day, he hated, he thought PVC drain pipe was a commie plot. All right. And this was from a time when commie plots weren't that crazy. He thought it was a commie plot. He hated it. Absolutely hated it. And when he when it actually forced to do it, he refused to lose the use the cleaner. He'd use the glue. But he said the cleaner's BS. I'm not using cleaner. 
he would use emery cloth, sand cloth, and he'd scruff up the end of the pipe and the inside of the fitting and then then put the glue in. He flat refused to use cleaner. Absolutely refused. Yeah. Nah, you evolve, right? It's a matter of getting the job done. How quickly can you get the job done? Uh, anything that 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 can impact the number one cost on your on your on your sheet on your cost sheet which is your labor if you can get it done faster and charge the same price you make more money per man hour and you have more inventory to 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 do more work your inventory as an installer as a contractor as a business person your inventory is one hour of time right yeah. that's the product that's the widget you have to sell and you have a limited number of hours anything you can do to maximize that my way of thinking is a good thing but that's my opinion so, yeah. very good. Yeah. Correct, correct. All right. A lot of good, uh, some more good questions here. There we go. Uh, ba -bum -bum -bum. Pro press with antifreeze. Um, my my sense is I have not heard anything. And again, I'm not a pro press expert other than, yeah, you, know, you stick it in, you pull the trigger, and <laughs> there you go. Uh, have you guys heard anything about antifreeze affecting those systems? I have not, but then again, I haven't been paying attention for it either. I think what he's referring to is it is just an O ring that makes the you know primary seal of the fluid getting out of the system and i think probably what he's saying is do, do uh, different types of antifreeze potentially can affect the type of rubber o-ring that's in there uh, rubber is a general term of course it's it's probably uh what a viton or or whatever uh, some some rubbers have uh more issues with glycol mixtures and uh, and not that's something for you to check with whoever fitting that you're buying and find out how many different types of uh, O-ring uh, materials you can get and use the one that's best for what you're using. Yeah. Richard McGrath, who's again one guy who doesn't really dive into anything else. He knows exactly what's going on. Uh, Rich McGrath says, no issues with uh, ProPress so far, but only with propylene glycol, not ethylene glycol, like, like automotive antifreeze, which you shouldn't use in a heating system anyway. Hasn't yeah. tried that, can't say, but propylene glycol, which is the, which is heating system antifreeze. So far, so good. No problems. Vegetable oil. Yeah, there you go. And Corey Herkart says, if you use ethylene glycol after a while, da you will damage the EPM gasket. So that, yeah, that, yeah, you got to make sure you use the right stuff. So you, never, and, to me. you know, I and, and glycol over time, you know, if not checked and and looked at, it's going to yeah. turn a little more acidic too. So mm -hmm. it's going to hurt other things before it even hurts the rubber before that. So um, yeah. you know, just got to maintain the maintain the the chemicals that you put into a boiler system, definitely. It never occurred to me in all the years I worked for my dad, it never occurred to me to put automotive antifreeze in a heating system. I, I don't know. Is that, is that, is that a thing? Is that weird? I mean, it just never even occurred to me. We, and even when I didn't know anything, you bought, you bought like, you know, the, you bought the, the heating system antifreeze from the wholesaler and that's what you use. It never, it, it's a lot of putting, why don't we just put some press stone in there? That never came, that never entered my mind. <laughs> I guess some people have done it. Just because yep. that's what they had laying around, or well, they could get that. Yep. Well, here's a here's a this is this looks this looks promising from Jeff House. Let's see what Jeff has to say. If you had a boiler capable of delivering multiple output temperatures, depending which zone is calling, but a higher temperature zone calling would adjust the temperature up, even though the low temperature zone is still calling. To protect the low temperature zone, you would add a mixing valve with outdoor reset. The temperature difference. The low temp zone C's could be small. Will the mixing valve mix down to say 110 degrees if the supply side is only 120 degrees? Yes and no. Good answer. <laughs> <I like that. laughs> or it's I, like, it depends. Yes. Clarify if he's talking about an actuated valve like an I valve, or if he's talking about a tempering valve like one of our little mixing valves. Uh, we'd have that's to clarify was, that, Jeff. That's yeah. why I gave a yes and no answer there. Yeah. If you say yes, then you need to use a floating mixing valve. It's going to have a motor on it and be able to do that. So you can take that valve and go to full, almost 100% open. And based upon the 120 coming in on the hot side, it can give you almost 110 going out. You're doing a standard three-way mix valve. Yeah, no, they're not gonna. You know, thermostatic needs to see at least, uh, and a lot of them, especially in the radiant ones, about a 27 degree spread between the hot and the mix temperature that you're going to send out there. So you're going to have to jack up that temperature of the house. 
um, uh, on the boiler itself in order to get that valve to do what it's supposed to do. So if you ever do a modulating boiler or outdoor reset on the boiler side and you've got mixing going on, use a, a modulating mix valve too. So that would be the best way in what I consider um, making it do what it's supposed to do. Otherwise, you may compromise that radiant zone and not get the right temperature going out to it. Very good. Yep. The I valve. There we go. That's that's the way to look at it. Ethylene glycol was often called for in older glycol crack unit dry cooler systems. Don't see it nowadays. I'm not sure I'd even see a crack unit dry cooler system. I'm not sure what that is, but I'll take your word for it that it that it used ethylene glycol. John, that's a good one. Um why does TACO, which way does TACO recommend supply or return and does it affect operation? Thanks, Harry. Uh, are you talking about pumping where the, where the circulator should go, Harry? Is that what you're asking? Or um, the zone valve? Or the zone valve. Yeah. Which, what, which, which question are you asking there, Harry? If you could elaborate on that and we'd be yeah. happy to answer it for you. There you go. Yeah. And, and just so I can put it out there too, um, if this may be your first or second time that you've joined us for Takeaway After Dark, uh, we have recorded all of these sessions. And I know we we did cover some of these things in Pumping Away in, in uh, I think session two, possibly, maybe session three. Mm -hmm. Session um, three, I think. Session three, so we do have those recorded. They are on Mechanical Hub's YouTube page, as well as Takeo's YouTube page. So you can go back and, and watch them again if need be uh, to get any further detail. But we also don't mind talking about it here too. So um, just clarify what you were looking for there, Harry. Uh, oh, there he goes. He says pump location. Yeah. Pump location, we have no recommendations. I mean, it, it, you can put the pump on your on your supply. You can put the pump on the return. Uh, pumping away is always going to be better. If, if you're ripping out a boiler, and you're putting in a new boiler and all that, and everything's being rebuilt, pump away from the point of no pressure change where the expansion tank connects to the system. No reason not to, the benefits are many and wide and varied, so absolutely do that. If you have a boiler, you're servicing a boiler and there's a pump on the return and it's dead and you gotta replace it, there's no reason not to, to leave the pump right there. You know, just re you know, swap a dead, a, a, the dead pump out, put a live pump in, but leave it on the return. That system's been working for decades with the pump on the return. There's no reason to move, to repipe it. You know what I'm saying? You just got to make sure, though, Harry, that you use the right circulator. If you put a high head circulator on the return side, you know, like your standard three speed pump, that's a high, it's a low flow, high head, steep curve pump. You put that on the return side in place of a circulator that was a higher flow, lower head, flatter curve pump. You're changing the dynamics of the system and you're going to create problems that weren't necessarily there before. So if you're gonna replace a dead pump on the return side, make sure replace, you replace the dead pump with a pump whose performance characteristics are pretty similar to the one you've taken out. Typical flat curve pump like a 007, something like that is gonna make a lot more sense than a steep curve pump, like your three-speed pump, like the, the Takeo 0015 standard efficiency, the Grunfuss 1558 pumps like that, they just don't make sense there. So that's, 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 that's the way I would look at that for pump location. Okay, what else? We got a lot more here. Uh, ba bum 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 uh, do, 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 do. Bring, uh, bring in the floor and air handlers for cooling. Do the low temps, 36 to 38, have an effect on the life of the pump? Uh, again, I just, depends on this. Okay, I depends sent, on I sent him something on that, yeah. Uh, okay, which, which pump we would check what the low temperature requirements of that particular pump are. Very yeah. good, very good. Uh, da -dum 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 -dum. Let's see, with, with a combi boiler uh, that uses two different water pressure and temperature levels, what's the rating on the what what's the rating on the T and P valve? That's a, that's a yeah that's a question. I, I don't have the answer to that, Rick. I, you you probably have a little bit more to do with those. Two different systems are completely isolated if it's a true combi boiler. So you're going to need a, a relief valve for the boiler side based on whatever you know would be typical for that 30 psi um and depending if there's any storage capacity like a buffer tank would determine whether you need a tmp or not so mm -hmm. it's two different systems two yep. different you know one's going to uh, pop at 125 one's going to pop at slightly be below 30 so I uh, uh, hope that answers the question. So. 
Very good. Here's something from Bill D'Agostino. To clarify in the mixing valve, the Takeo 5000 instructions say only it only requires a 10 degree minimum temperature difference between nope. the hot supply and the outlet. Since that 27. is a minimum, since that is a minimum, does that mean you should design more on at least a 20 degree temperature? That's a good question, Bill. And we have we get two different sets of of mixing valves. One mixing valve has a 20, requires a 27 degree difference, and we do have a couple uh, for domestic hot water specifically that are on a 10 degree difference. Yep. Um, so yeah. again, it's going to it's going to depend on which one you're looking at. And I may have mixed that up in my head too on which one was which there. So, okay. you know, whether it's the heating one or our, our plumbing valves that we have. So, and there's, you know, what do we have? Twelve different well, mixing valves out there. Well, we got a bunch of them, yeah. but look at the ASSE listing, right? A 1017 will have a 27 degree. A 1070 will have a 10 degree. So look at that listing on it and that'll kind of help you very good very good all right another great performance thank you gentlemen see you next week see you jeff thank you really appreciate it now see we're, you, down about, we're down about 97 left and we got still we got anthony Ryko in the house uh okay, jeff kelly thank you very much and, and stay on guys as long as you want uh it's up to you we'll stay on here as long as you want if you guys want to end it now we can do that but whatever questions you might have we're happy to stick around, but it seems like everybody's kind of checking out. All righty. Well, thank you guys. Really do appreciate y'all being here. I think this might be a good, this might be a sign <laughs> that uh, <laughs> we want to make it an early Wednesday night. So it's getting past my bedtime too, Anthony. <laughs> yes, it's been, a, it's, been a, it's been a long seven weeks, but it's still been a, it's been a good Wednesday night, you know, yeah. enjoying it too. So um, pass it along to you, buddies. I know we're trying to come out of this and, I'm hearing people opening up and going back to work and whatnot, but uh, hey, we still got Wednesday nights, you know, take yep. away after dark. So come yep. hang out, definitely. Hey, Absolutely. Barbara, you're uh, you're Mr. Peabody now. I just saw that. What the heck, <laughs> Mr. Mr. The little dog, dude. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Peabody and his boy Sherman. I love I love that cartoon. That was fantastic. But come on, Mr. Mr. Peabody. Yeah, he says you were schmat. <laughs> uh, schmat, maybe, but you know, there were, how about, you know, something schmatter than that? You know, Obi Wan Kenobi was schmat. You call me Obi Wan. I would like that, you know? <laughs> you know? Danny Ocean was smart. You call me Danny Ocean, right? Because George Clooney and I get mixed up for each other all, uh, uh, time. all the time. I all the time. Time. I was chatting with him just the other day, and he says, another woman came up to me and said, hey, John. Oh, wait, no, you're not him. Happens to him. It's embarrassing for the poor man. It's embarrassing for the poor man. Yeah. So well, Peabody anyway. had Peabody had a chalkboard and a pointer. I would say That's that true. might be Rich Medeiros. We'll call him Mr. Peabody. Ooh, now there you go. There yeah. you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, do, do you have a sell sheet to show the improvements of Taco? Asked Corey. Uh, we have, we have, uh, I, I'm not quite sure where you, where you mean there, Corey, but tell you what, Corey, give me, give us a, give us an email. Um, you, you'll get my email address tomorrow. Just give me an email and tell me exactly what you mean and, and how we can help you. We've got, uh, we've got a lot of great stuff. taco has got a ton of really good stuff that I think, you know, you, you talk about Grunfoss. Grunfoss makes great stuff too. They're a world-class manufacturer, just like us. Uh, just a matter of what uh, what what products do you find that fit your needs the best, and what uh, you know what what delivery chain everybody everything from you know like what we do here to your rep to your wholesaler and everybody else which which best fits your needs, and I think that's that's kind of the decision making process I always could I tell people to go to to work through. Uh, but you know we've got we've got some awesome products and we'd love to share them with you, Corey. So uh, do me a favor, just shoot me an email, and I'll tell I will. Do this. I will type in my email address right here, so you can you can hit me up directly at come take go come fort .com. You have my email. All right. Well, <laughs> you have it again. <laughs> you yeah, just shoot me a note, Corey, and we'll yak. All right. That'll that'll work out okay. Would the PC 700-2 not turn the boiler off from a dry well, as questioned before, or the fuel miser? PC 700 turn the boiler off. If it hit a certain temperature, yeah, right. But it's also going to give you a little bit of, of reset as well. If that's and what you're you going to be getting a whole bunch of stuff that 
you're probably not even going to use. I mean, yeah. I, it might be an expensive device. Yeah. I mean, I, I, again, I, the way I took it was we're just looking for an Aquastat, right? You know, uh, uh, digital. Well, I don't think he said digital, but something that uses like a thermistor yeah. that has adjustment on the unit that will make and break power TT to the boiler. God, I remember years ago using, I forget, I forget the name of the product, but it was, it was deceptively simple. It was just, you set the temperature, there was a probe, once you hit above the temperature, bam, it <laughs> shut something off, below the temperature, bam, it turned something on. Yep. Yeah. Fuel miser kind of, can be kind of simple like as well. Yeah. yeah, like a thermostat. Fuel miser, Richard, might be able to do something like that. I guess I'd have to, it's been so long since I've looked at the fuel miser, I'd have to uh, do a double check. Dave, you, any thoughts on using the fuel miser there? Um. Yeah, it's uh, because of the dial is is too sensitive. I mean, it yeah. doesn't go high enough. It doesn't go high. It's only it's, it only goes to a high of forty mm. on the dial. So yeah, you're not gonna be able to get a lot out of that too. Yeah. This one's having an unsatisfactory resolution to it. I can tell. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, at least coming out of our inventory and what we have. Yeah. 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 I'm sure there's there's plenty of it. Oh God, Echo Line. I'm um, just that's guys bother me. I can picture the product in my head. I can't remember the name. Gold of it, Line. Gold Line. Thank you. Gold Line. Yes. There it is. Yes. The Gold yes, Line. Yes, I I used a couple of Gold Line controls in some of my old Radiant projects that were funky. You know, I, I remember this one Radiant job I I got called out to, um, in the middle of upstate New York, in the middle of these orchards, that this uh guy owned. And in the middle of the orchard was a pond, a natural pond that was there. And for the life of, of owning that pond, he wanted to try to clear it, clear the water. He filtered it. He put all this equipment on there trying to clean up the water, but there was no way he was going to get it cleaned. So he drained it and cemented it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why not? But it was all enclosed around trees, so then it got cold. And it's in the middle of his farm. So all he had was electricity out there. And now he wanted to heat this thing. I mean, this is, it was just as funny stories as it went on and on and on. And so he says, I want to, how about we do solar heat? But he wanted to put some tubing, some PEX tubing in an asphalt pad and then run that back into the pool. So he would bypass some of the water from the pool out to this concrete pad, um, which was all blacktop, and then send it back. And uh, we we ended up using a couple of gold line controls on it. So I remember that. That was, oh, man, that was 20 years ago that I messed around with that system. So fun stuff. Yeah, very good. Very good. It's like a Bev like the Beverly Hills Hillbillies Cement Ponds. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was like. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. yeah. All righty. Well, a lot of guys are saying good night. So uh, good night, Richard. Good night, Jeff. Good night. Corey, good night, Carlton. Good night, John Boy. Good night, Mary Ellen. Good night, Elizabeth. <laughs> good night, Waltons. <laughs> hey, guys, thank you very much again. John Messenbrink, are you still with us? You might, have, you might, have, you might have fallen asleep too. Oh, there he is. <laughs> there he is, John. Oh, he is asleep. Wake up there, John. Well, anyway, guys. I'm, I'm here. You know, I, you know, thanks again for. Uh, Another great presentation. Thanks for the 60 or so people still left on, on on the webinar. This is great. So look forward to next week. Absolutely. Part eight, the Rick Mayo show. So you got one week. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I if we did this well in advance and prepared for it, what you'd lose respect for me, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Cool we'll enough. Talk. We'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah, all right, folks. Everybody, good to see you again. Have Enjoy a great week. See you next week.